I mean, God, God damn the pusher, pusher man. I say, God damn the pusher man. Ah, God. Oh. He's trying to put a jacket on his. I'm trying to get out of a straight jacket. Trying, trying to get into a straight jacket all on your own. Usually most people try to get in a straight jacket and have some help. You know, Jesus Christ. What does it feel right now? The sleeves all tucked in there. God damn the pusher man. Here it goes a little. Uh, well, Hudson ran off. When I start struggling like this, he gets nervous. Hudson is my dog. As you can see, I'm kind of kind of spry for my age. You know how old I am? I'm 161 years old. Oh, I'm, I made a mistake on that. It's not 161. It's 191. The number was upside down. No, I'm just kidding. I'm actually only 91. Oh, wait a minute. I got that upside down, too. It's, I'm actually 16 years old. And you're wondering what's wrong with this guy. I've been diagnosed by several doctors, a neuromuscular surgeon or whatever the hell he was, general practitioner, Parkinson's Clinic at the OHSU, Oregon Health Sciences University. I'm trying to figure out what's he got. He's got something like Parkinson's. It's not Parkinson's. It's something else. And they treat it with L-dopamine. And my life has become a, a thing where I'm just become sort of ah, obsessed with Dopamine, L dopamine. And I'm a homeopath. And my wife died. My parents died. They were 191. And, and then I went through this probate. This has all happened about four years ago. I went through this probate thing over my wife's estate. And it fucking killed me. God damn, the pusher man. That's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing I've ever been through. I've been through some real hard things, like my first, my first divorce. That was horrible. That's the worst experience I've ever had in my entire fucking life, in that first divorce. And I'm, and I'm not blaming it on her. I mean, I'm responsible for every goddamn thing that's happened to me. I take full responsibility. I mean, I've been a real jerk. I behave like a real jerk. Hey, it's confession time. Don't you think? I thought I'd get a little dressed up today. Yeah. Yeah, see? So and uh, I forgot what I wanted to talk about. I guess I could always talk about cycles. Oh, did you know that if you make it, you know what an anagram is? Where you take the, take a couple of words or a word, scramble around and we'll write another word using those same letters? An anagram. Well, you know what the what one of the anagrams for Barack Hussein Obama is? You know, the, uh, the ex-president of the United States. I really liked that guy. He was a good guy. I felt, felt safe around him. Very deliberate. A lot of wisdom. Good guy. Best president ever. The best president ever. Since Carter, at least. Carter was a pretty good president. So was Eisenhower. What, what is that? Two... Well, Clinton was good. Clinton was a good president, too. Anyway. Oh. 
This is my dog Hudson, my co-host. Come here. Say hi to everybody. Come here. There he is. Hudson LaRue. Cuckoo LaRue. Well, I'm sorry I'm getting off, off track here. God damn it, Bush man. <laughs> yeah, so cycles. Yeah, oh, well, anagrams. <laughs> All over the map today, but what's new? Well, I'm always all over the map. But that's that's how I enjoy my life, is being back and forth, being ADHD. <laughs> it's got his head up here. Can you see that? Hey, turn around. <laughs> Sticking his head up. Sticking his head up between my legs. Yeah, Barack Hussein Obama, if you take an anagram <laughs> of his name, scramble all the rattles around. You know what it spells? Get this. You're gonna this is the probably the first time you're ever not but not the last time you'll hear this. Barack Hussein Obama. The letters in Barack Hussein Obama. Right. Turn them around. It says he is Mabus. No arc. A cab. <laughs> he, you know who Mavis was? If you're any student of, of Nostradamus, you'll know who, who Mavis was, was and is, and, and maybe will be. Mavis was, was this kind of unexplained character that pops up in the stanzas of uh, Nostradamus. Associated with the end of the world, and it's not really clear whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. But the uh, the quatrain reads something like, "Somebody will be assassinated after Mabus dies," and of course Mabus was, maybe still is, maybe they forgot to change that spot. Was the Secretary of the Navy under um, Obama? A guy named Mabus. I mean, that's no anagram. That, you know, it's, I forget what his last name was, or his first name was. Anyway, so there, there is a, there is a maybe it was a Mavis in government. So it could be referring to him, but I'll tell you, when your name spells he is Mavis, no Arca cab, that's got to mean something. And I've known this for years, and I've never said anything about it, because I thought, well, it's kind of strange. I mean, how do I write a blog about that? I don't know why I don't, I, I don't I'm not more forthcoming with it. Stuff like that. No arc, a cab. Now, so what does that mean? No arc, a cab. Like, you know, they're both conveyances of people, right? The public. <laughs> and a cab is a personal, is a personal conveyance that you hire a cab, you know, for you and your family, maybe could get into a cab, but not the, you know, not a generation of people. But the next generation, which would be what the ark is. You don't put your bets on him. <laughs> and that's not the only uh, anagram that there is in Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, a lot of references to Iran, to bombing Iran, bomb bomb Iran. And uh, the Sabra, which are the uh, Israeli kind of a name for a nickname for the new Jew, but it's been it's not so new anymore because it was a term I think that was more popular back in the fifties and sixties. The Sabra, kind of the almost like the Jewish underground in Israel. Interesting stuff out of an anagram. So. What do you think the anagram for Donald John Trump is? See if you can find out. Don't make me do all the work. You, you do it. Well, let's see. I've got nine. I'm nine minutes into my show here. Quickly running out of time. What do I talk about? Oh, cycles. Do you know if you take 1776, the date of the American Revolution, as your starting point, and you go 80 years 
from that point, you get the Civil War. So between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, it was about 80 years. If you go another 80 years into the future from the Civil War, that'd be World War II in the 1940s. If you go another 80 years from the 1940s, you know what that is? 2020, 2020, the year of doom. <laughs> now what are you gonna do? This is gonna drive you nuts, isn't it? I've been thinking about this and, and I don't know if you ever read that book, The Fourth Turning. I can't remember the name of the guys that wrote that book. Brilliant stuff. I mean, I had to have that book when it came out years ago. They talk about these turnings, these generations. There's about four generations within a saculum. I think they call it a saculum of 20 years each. And we can generation X, the baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I know I was lying about my age. Anyway, um, baby, baby boomers. The, my dad's generation was the, uh, the silent generation, I think. And the, he came right on the heels of the heroes, which are the guys that mainly fought in World War II. My dad was in World War II. But real conservative kind of demeanor. I mean, he was a classical liberal in, during the 60s and a uh, became a, you know, a rabid, bigoted conservative <laughs> in the 2000s. Because of Fox News and Rush Limbaugh. So, <laughs> uh, then, then Obama, I think, is Generation, isn't he Generation X? Yeah. And then my kids are, are millennials. And the, uh, my boys, my, my tribe, <laughs> didn't have spurt a lot of boys. Um, Biological and otherwise. Anyway, the last generation to be named is Generation Z. And I keep wondering, why would they label a Generation Z the last generation? I mean, please. There's enough stuff with Obama, you know, no arc of cab going around. We don't need any more. <laughs> We don't need any more stuff to scare us. So I've been thinking that that if this appears to be very cyclic and very predictable, what the heck is going on? And the only thing that I can come up with is that it's a purge. And it's a, it's a regular purge that man has to go through. And it's kind of unaware of it. Because if he, makes, he becomes too aware of it, he might not go through with it. Say, oh, we're just going through another purge cycle. Everybody just relax. <laughs> You know, whatever you do, don't kill each other. You know, try to keep your hands to yourself. And your other stuff in your pants. You know what I mean? Just relax. And then wouldn't happen. And it was, and the future of the human race is dependent on it. In other words, you had to go through a purge cycle. Get rid of the loafers and, and the intellectuals. <laughs> and uh, the mud races. You know, people from shithole countries have to go first. You're first. Women and kids first. No, actually, it's, you line up everybody up. You line all, all the young, eligible young men up in a line going this way. And you get another bunch of them and wearing some different color uniform. Gray. Wasn't it the blue? A bunch of guys wearing blue standing in line. Facing a bunch of guys in gray facing standing in line with what started out to be muskets, but then somebody got a machine gun, you know, anyway, it started <laughs> the implementation of Gatling gun, you know, mass murder. <laughs> so this is a prerogative, a natural human prerogative to go to war and thin everybody out. Say, come on, we're getting, there's too many people on the planet. Off, some people, get off, you, off, off the planet. Make room for the new. You know, it keeps us strong. Survival of the fittest. 
you'll have to go. You're not fit. Anyway, so what's, what's, the, what's the counterpoint to that? In other words, how do we respond to that? And I only have been able to come up with one answer. One answer. One thing. If we could do this one thing, we might be able to skip all the misery and get through it, through with it, you know, heads back and our feet up. You know what I mean? Staying at home, being your own boss. Yeah. Well, my study of things, and I'm a studied man. I've been on the planet a while. I've read a lot of stuff. You've seen my library. It's, it's extensive. It covers the whole house. I live in a large house, and I have, every room is library in this house. Books. I have thousands of books. I'm in a deep study of this. And there is only one statement that's worth a damn. You'll find it in the Bible. At my, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and uh, an abbreviated version of it, at Luke 6. And these are manifest, this is a manifest, I should say, this is a manifesto about human conduct and getting by. It's basically the doctrine of love. Yeah. You could rip it out of the Bible. You could rip, rip out Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, Luke 6 out of the Bible and throw the rest away and you wouldn't be missing much. You know what I mean? If you've got that, use the rest for rip out, rip out the Sermon on the Mountain, the Sermon on the Plain, and use the rest for toilet paper. That's what I'm that's the difference here. That's the the dimorphism of it. You know what I mean? I was in jail once. They stuck me in jail for I won't go into details. Contempt of court. Of course, what could be better than contempt of court? And they stuck me in a cell with a guy um, from the Crips gang. And this guy got to uh, doing the rap stuff. I was in there for several days. They kept me for a week. He started rapping. You know, my cellmates like going through. This. I thought, oh, this is going to drive me nuts. Got to get him off this without getting killed. So I said, uh, you know, you're pretty good. You already have a wonderful memory. You could put that memory to pretty good use. Now, take me. I have uh, I do pretty well. I've got a Harley Davidson motorcycle, a Cadillac, nice clothes, live in a big house. Doing pretty well. And I'm, I'm telling you, you could have the same thing if you follow my advice. Because what's that? I said, well, find a Bible and memorize Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I told him the story of, uh, well, that's another story about the earthquake. I'll save that for another time. It kind of underlines what I told this guy, though. I mean, it was amazing. It was a miracle. What a coincidence. The earthquake and violent windstorm that canceled the trial, and nobody showed up against it, testify against me, and they had to let me go. When I got back into the, into the, uh, there had been an earthquake underneath. The, after I told this guy the story of the of the earth, an earthquake clearing out a courtroom when I was put on trial, another earthquake hit underneath the jail and just freaked this guy out. He was studying that Bible. He memorized the Sermon on the Mount. He thought I was, a, I was, a, you know, some an angel. He thought I was a man of God. And he, was, and he started memorizing the uh, Sermon on the Mount. That's the most important statement made to mankind. Did you know that? I mean, by co collective approbation, by popular acclaim. That's the number one statement made to mankind. Now, what's it about? It's about getting along, getting along with each other. It's a very human document. <laughs> it's not any of this capitalist stuff. The first, the first line is, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit, for, excuse me, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's an anti-materialist creed. I mean, it's really pretty cool when you think about it. It's fourth, it's fourth phase science. It's, pl it's plasma physics. It's human potential. You can do anything. 
You learn that thing and you can do anything. You won't have anything to worry about, no matter how bad it is. Well, it's 1938, so I'm almost at 20 minutes. I'll leave a few seconds for a commercial. <laughs>